Chapter Seventeen of the Octave of Claudius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Octave of Claudius by Barry Payne. Chapter Seventeen. Saturday morning was fortunately for Claudius full of business. There were arrangements to be made, bills to be settled and a really good solicitor to be persuaded to do something in a hurry and the really good dislike hurry he had to call at the bank and at the publishers he had a score of trifles that needed his attention so far he had preserved appearance as well on his journey north and on his return he had spoken and acted in a normal way had forgotten nothing given no sign of absent-mindedness allowed no railway porter or chance travelling companion even the vague idea that there must be something the matter he had gone successfully through the ordeal of meeting with his father and parting from him but this morning it was different every business act was a great effort to him continually he had to recall his thoughts and to concentrate his attention sometimes he would find that he had forgotten to say something of importance and sometimes that he had repeated some needless commonplace a remark on the weather for instance two or three times but the flicker of a suppressed smile on the face of the man who happened to be talking with him at the time gave him no annoyance the same thing that made him capable of small mistakes made him incapable of small annoyances the excitement overmastered him the excitement of love returned yet hopeless a fortune gained yet worthless of life continued yet worse than death of fate laughing and the end near two letters had reached him that morning at his london hotel by the first post one how often he had read it was from angela early on friday morning mrs wycherley had telegraphed to her husband and he had come at once first he had seen mrs wycherley alone then he had called angela down and taken her out in the garden with him he had seemed serious but not in the least angry with her on the contrary he had never been kinder he had questioned her but there had been some questions which she had to tell him she could not answer indeed she had not told him very much after that he had left for london angela had heard him say i shall certainly call upon lady verrider this afternoon she quoted another remark of his it's a case i think for a man of business and plain common sense and i am that and very little else at the end he had tried to cheer angela up and told her that all might be well he could not say for certain but he thought the case was not quite hopeless if claudius could be got to listen to reason her little budget of news told poor child somewhat incoherently occupied by a little of her long letter the rest was quite sacred and quite human and to claudius most lovely and priceless and sad the second letter which was from mr wycherley ran as follows my dear mr sandell i intend to call at your hotel to-morrow saturday afternoon at five and take my chance of finding you i know that you will naturally be much occupied but i hope you'll be able to spare a few minutes in which to see me i'm far from thinking that you have acted to say the least of it with discretion but i do not want you to suppose that i'm calling in order to blame you or oppose you the happiness of my only child is very dear to me and any obstacle to that must be removed if i can remove it believe me i am only anxious to secure what you yourself must wish i may be able to help you and i hope you will let me try from the little that i have been able to learn i think that my business experience may be of service to you the letter presented mr wycherley to claudius as the very image of the completely kind father on the utterly wrong tack but of course he determined to see him he wished first to see lady verrider but the business of the morning prolonged itself into the afternoon and it was after four before he arrived at her house lady verrider paced the room she was beautifully dressed and quite furious angry and affectionate by turns and the more angry because she was really fond of him he had to listen to tirades 
what did i tell you what did i warn you i knew what would happen what was bound to happen if you went to gilbridge oh i know that devout lover type so well it's going to love in silence and it never does it's going to worship from afar and it always insists on propinquity it is determined to be content with very little and it never is and if it's good-looking as i suppose you are and takes trouble as i know you did it may manage to make some poor girl love it and confess her love then the devout lover raises his hat politely and says good morning and how sorry he is that it can never be and he had never dreamed that it would come to that and he is not worthy and so on then he walks off pretty figure isn't he my dear lady i am not that cur exactly i told angela from the first that the rest of my life was not mine then the time was so short just a few days it did not seem possible that any harm could happen angela was and is so far beyond me that i did not suppose no you devout lovers never do suppose that any perfectly ordinary thing can possibly happen but why did you say that you loved her why did you tell her my god said claudius with sudden passion do you ask me that have you never been in love yes i was in love with the man i married that is one of the reasons why i am so sorry for the poor girls who are made to fall in love with the men that they can never marry i dare say said claudius that you will tell me that it is the usual formula of the devout lover but i can only say again that i did not expect what happened of course lady verrida continued i know in my heart that you don't deserve what i say to you but i am angry and miserable you are not a cur i almost wish you were what i am afraid of in you is your silly out-of-date romantic highfalutin chivalry nothing but that i am convinced could have got you into your present impossible position i have been talking to mr wycherley a very sensible little man he quite agrees with me there was a pause and then lady verrider asked quickly you went to see your father are you reconciled no formal reconciliation took place the past was ignored you know his way but we're on the best of terms he insisted on giving me money ten thousand and you also made a small fortune by speculation i am told yes i made some money and your novel has been accepted and angela would marry you and just at this point you disappear and will not explain why i cannot explain it to you i have told angela and she will tell no one will you tell me one little thing you say that your life has been disposed of to whom who is this mysterious man in the background his name please just his real name and nothing more tell me that and the rest i will manage for myself i know you ask it from the kindest motives i am ashamed not to be able to tell you if the secret were all my own it should be yours too and at once but it is not only mine i cannot tell you oh i give it up it's killing me and i'm absolutely miserable i am sorry indeed said claudius that i should distress you in this way she stood before the mantelpiece moving little objects on it restlessly mind you she added suddenly you will find mr wycherley far more determined that may be i am to see him almost directly i must be going he has certain rights now you've given him those rights yes i'm glad you told angela and you cannot get over them dear lady verrider don't speak as if i wanted to get over them i'm not a natural martyr i'm longing to be free and happy my wishes are just the same as yours and wycherley's if without knowing the circumstances and i cannot tell him them he can show me a possible solution i shall welcome it then claudius said good-bye he assured lady verrider that he would do all he could and reminded her that some unforeseen chance might possibly favor him but she would not be assured she had a presentiment she said that she would never see him again claudius found mr wycherley at the hotel how is angela claudius asked eagerly she is very unhappy the little man replied simply he was rather nervous at first 
observed that the rain still kept off inquired as to the health of sir constantine fidgeted with his hat then he put down the hat seated himself wiped his forehead and plunged now mr sandell you know that i have seen my wife and daughter jessica is you may have noticed it a little inclined to be vague if i may put it so she never seems actually to know anything about anything i'm not finding fault with her for it you'll understand it's in her nature and we're none of us perfect i mention it to account for any mistakes i have made in forming my idea of the situation angela is far more clear in her statements but she will not go beyond a certain point she could tell but won't my wife would but can't will you let me question you somewhat plainly that i may correct myself where i am wrong ask anything and plainly as you will i will tell you all that i can you love my daughter and would marry her yes the simple answer was as effective as a more fervent protest but after tonight you cease to be your own master of the remainder of your life some disposition was made before you met angela yes i've known young men good fellows really make for themselves unending trouble youth hot blood and ignorance they do a deal of harm pardon me but is there is there another woman in the case no has there been some previous er uh, nothing nothing i have never loved nor ever shall love any one else i believe you indeed you tell me what i expected but i wanted to be quite sure that finishes with woman we come to money claudius handed mr wycherley some memoranda and letters one dated that day from the bank no 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 protested mr wycherley it's not necessary i would rather said claudius mr wycherley examined and his face fell if all this money will not help then the case is bad indeed no amount of money could help the case is bad indeed i want you also to read this it is my will by which i leave all unconditionally to angela my solicitors are also acting as my executors and i am just returning it to them mr wycherley stared at the carpet god help her was all he said i knew it was nothing said claudius after a pause all that i can do now is nothing i shall not at least die happily die die exclaimed mr wycherley suddenly then you expect to die is that so is it is it i cannot tell you but i think you have told me you leave me to work in the dark you won't show me the reason the motive if it had been woman i could have helped you for i was once young if it had been money i could have helped you for i am now old it seems that it's neither but i have worked in the dark before in the city i needn't go into it but i have had to play the game when i did not know what the game was or where it would end but as i have gone on i have found a glimmer here and a glimmer there until at last there was light enough i'm going to work in the dark now for already mr sandell i've seen the glimmer just the faintest now you said that i might question you tell me under what compulsion you agreed that within a few days you would sacrifice your life i did not guess at the time claudius paused go on go on said mr wycherley excitedly you say that you did not guess at the time that there was an actual peril of life however you know it now go on there was no compulsion whatever i was broken down at that time and did not think that my life could ever have any value for me but why to this man why give it to him mr wycherley it's no use said claudia i beg you not to ask me any more questions i've had no sleep and i'm worn out i can't think clearly and i can't trust myself to talk i'm so afraid of telling you things unintentionally which i am bound in honour not to tell don't think me ungrateful i am not that you have been very kind to me when you might with justice have been only very angry yes said mr wycherley you look tired and ill i had noticed that 
i won't question you any further on the contrary instead of asking for an explanation i will give you one i'm nothing much you know only a business man but angela is is a good deal to me i can't see the rest of her life spoiled and i won't do it nor will i let you be murdered because of some sense of honor which as a business man i can't understand you feel yourself bound by a contract of a nature which the law doesn't allow i've not been angry with you though you were in the wrong to go to gilbridge in the first place once there the rest was inevitable now you must not be angry with me if i should seem afterwards to have interfered with you for i am going on working how in what way it is my turn to say that i cannot tell you claudius thought for a few moments you are justified he said mr Witcherly. there is one more thing to say i must tell you how sorry i am the worst that i have to bear is that angela should suffer i never dreamed that she would come to care for me my days were so few i thought the joy and the sorrow of it would be mine alone and now when i think of it and how you and her mother love her i see that i have done the worst thing i ever did in my life i have done a terrible thing that will weigh me down to the end angela will not let me ask for forgiveness and will not hear that there is anything to forgive you know how much there is i won't say there's nothing to forgive said mr Witcherly, and then very simply and kindly he held out his hand but it's all right claudius i believe you're a good fellow i couldn't have wished for a better for angela i should be a harder man than i am if i couldn't forgive you now i see how you're placed if you're to be saved it must be in spite of yourself and in spite of you i'm going on working when you come tonight to say good-bye to angela remember that she takes things hard don't let her think that it's the last time that she'll never see you again you understand of course perfectly thank you thank you very much it was arranged between them that claudius was to call at ursiston square at nine o'clock that night he was to see angela alone and only angela mr Witcherly was no sooner outside the hotel than his work began and he was not he thought working so completely in the dark now he remembered all that he had heard from his wife from angela from lady verida from claudius himself he pieced his information together rapidly and formed his conjectures the commissionaire called a cab for him where to sir the man asked ludgate circus said mr Witcherly. from ludgate circus mr Witcherly had not far to go to the office of mr abraham penny's detective agency it was after six on saturday night but that office knows no hours his business was simplicity itself a young gentleman description given would arrive at mr Witcherly's house at nine o'clock that night he would leave it for some other house before twelve for he had to be at this other house by twelve mr Witcherly wished to know where this other house was who its occupants were and and all that could be discovered about them in fact mr Witcherly would like a report to this effect to be on his breakfast table on sunday morning and would then send further instructions until these were received a close watch by night and day was to be kept on that other house and every movement of that young gentleman or of the occupants of the house was to be followed and reported to mr Witcherly at once and mr Witcherly hoped that there would be no difficulty difficulty said the assistant manager it's the a b c we see the young gentleman go into your house and follow him when he comes out you shall hear from us by eleven on sunday morning and anything that turns up further as the day goes on you don't want the young gentleman or his companions to suspect they're shadowed and you'd like the thing to be done thoroughly quite so put your best men on to it and don't spare expense want a check in advance or a reference not from you sir said the assistant manager 
and thereby showed his astuteness and he showed it further by not putting his best men on to do work which the less good could do equally well mr wycherley was well pleased he had common sense and had proved it as he entered the omnibus that would take him nearest to assistant square he smiled upon his achievement but common sense is not the gift of prophecy and mr wycherley little knew what the next few hours were to bring how is angela he asked his wife as soon as he got home mrs wycherley was troubled and tremulous she doesn't cry any more not since this morning she seems to me to try to talk of other things and cheer me up and there's nothing breaks me down more than that coming from her takes nothing a biscuit and a glass of wine that i insisted upon but nothing more so she won't be down to dinner you saw mr sandell what have you done i saw him and i have done the right thing go and tell angela that claudius will come to say good-bye to her at nine to-night that i have been doing what i can and have good reason to hope that claudius will not be away long but one moment before i go what have you really done don't tell angela for she'd tell claudius and he must not know or it would spoil all not a word i've put it in the hands of abraham penny penny what penny private detective ah and then was mrs wycherley greatly comforted and refreshed for like most really good women she had a faith in private detectives that never reasoned why and could not be justified by facts end of chapter seventeen recording by john brandon chapter eighteen of the octave of claudius this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the octave of claudius by barry payne chapter eighteen there was a little back sitting-room in the house in our sister square which had been known in the witcherleys earlier days as the library angela had objected that there were no books in it and that therefore it was not a library so mrs wycherley who could see a point very well when her attention was directed to it decided that it should be called the breakfast room and issued a solemn kitchen decree to that effect there were relapses into the use of the word library on the part of the housemaid a creature of habit mrs wycherley took a strong line and the weeping maiden obtained a fixed idea that the use of the word library was indecent so the breakfast room triumphed and was securely established nobody ever breakfasted there of course it was in this room lit by two red shaded candles on the mantelpiece that claudius said good-bye to angela the dim rose light was kind to her pale face claudius had no longer any hope at all in his own heart mr wycherley might attempt something it did not much matter what he attempted claudius knew that dr lamb would be clever enough to foresee that some such attempt might be made and clever enough to checkmate it yet he spoke to angela as if he would come back perhaps and she too spoke as one who hoped then at times a hard look of horror came into her soft eyes and both were very careful not to raise the question of the purpose for which dr gabriel lamb needed claudius sandell remember said claudius that as long as i live i shall always be loving you but not to hear you say it any more cried angela if that should be it can't be it can't end like this oh claudius dear love what shall i do tell me what i should do how shall i wait for you mrs wycherley had quite realized that this was an emotional hour in her house and that for the sake of others she must bear up to that end she took a glass of cocoa wine and found it a broken reed 
the poor silly affectionate woman loved her beautiful daughter so dearly that the thought of angela's unhappiness made composure impossible she was in her bedroom now with her cap off all sobs and sal volatile the undignified love as much as the dignified this idea of an emotional hour this sense that there was sorrow in the house had even permeated into the basement cook sniffed the housemaid the one who had never said library now observed it's my sunday out to-morrow but i shan't take it a dark saying a vague well-meant effort to get into keeping with the general atmosphere mr wycherley sat bolt upright in a straight-backed chair in the drawing-room he held the times in his hands and thought he was reading it and his face was solemn he was ready ready and waiting he would hear the breakfast-room door open and shut and the front door open and shut and the carriage drive away and at that moment he would emerge with a most cheerful smile and take the broken crying angela into his arms and he would say don't fret angela it's all right i couldn't tell you before but i have taken this in hand myself i have to-morrow morning you shall have news of claudius i promise it i absolutely promise it that would surely do some good her parents had entrusted angelo with comforting messages for claudius and with their farewells the messages were easily delivered the rest was difficult and as they will not see you to-night and it may be long before they see you again they asked me to say oh claudius i don't want to say good-bye her breast heaved and her lips trembled claudius drew her to him and kissed her again and again neither of them spoke any more now until the moment when claudius left the house he could hardly see his head swam he staggered like a man that has been drugged hardly had he flung himself back in his carriage before he fell asleep nature was exhausted he did not wake until the carriage entered the drive before dr lamb's house waking he wondered where he was for he had dreamed that he was back at home then he remembered he pulled out his watch and glanced at the time it still wanted ten minutes to twelve he got out and just as he was on the point of ringing the bell paused changed his mind and turned around you can put my portmanteau down he said you needn't wait very good sir the man replied there were still a few minutes of freedom left claudius clung to them the coachman hesitated before driving off claudius had been very liberal after all it might be as well to mention what he had noticed i beg your pardon he said but i'm not sure if you know we've been followed followed yes sir i noticed a hansom hanging about when i was waiting in Erciston square as soon as i drove off the cab followed it kept behind me all the way and when i turned in here went on a few yards and then stopped it's there now any one in the cab two men sir i only got a glimpse common looking they seemed thanks you are quite right to tell me though i don't know that it's of much importance the carriage drove off claudius stood beside his luggage with his watch in his hand after all then he supposed dr lamb had not trusted him and had put detectives on to follow him the black shrubberies stood out clear against the pale sky a breath of wind woke and rustled and fell again all was absolutely still in a moment claudius put his watch back in his pocket and rang the bell the sound spoke out resonant far back in the house and immediately the door opened almost before the bell sounded it was opened slowly and not to the full extent not as francis opened it 
Mrs. Lamb stood there. She was barefooted and in her nightdress. Her hair hung loose about her shoulders. Her eyes were wild and roaming. She spoke in a horrible whisper. I've been waiting behind the door for you. I got up and crept out, and they never knew. She shivered in the chill night air. Behind her was a chaos of packing cases. The carpets were up in the hall and on the stairs. The house looked naked. A gas jet flared without a globe. Mrs. Lamb, Claudius began. He was going to persuade her to go in. Poor, mad woman. But she would not let him speak. There is no time. Listen quickly before they come and take me. I have been sent by heaven to save you. You are to go away at once, and you must never come here again. She pointed to the passage that led to the study and laboratory. Gabriel's in there. Not the angel Gabriel, but the devil Gabriel. He's getting ready to kill you, sharpening knives. Every night I can hear him sharpen knives, though he does not want me to hear. Always sharpening knives. It goes like this. Brrr, brrr. She made a hideous, guttural imitation of the sound of a grindstone. At the same moment a door opened, and a woman in a plaid dressing gown came out. She had a cloak over one arm, and she said quietly, Mrs. Lamb, you must come back to bed. Hilda Lamb flung herself down on the floor of the hall, kicking and screaming. The nurse was a big woman, with a not unkindly face. She would not let Claudius help her, and indeed she needed no help. Her strength was enormous. She wrapped Mrs. Lamb in the cloak, lifted her, and carried her off. Then Claudius saw that the servant Francis was standing waiting at the further end of the hall. He now came forward, greeted Claudius respectfully, and began to carry in the luggage. Dr. Lamb is in the study, sir, he said. My dear Sandell, said the doctor, cordially, coming forward as Sandell entered. Welcome to a half-empty and exceedingly uncomfortable home. I trust that you have been enjoying yourself in your absence. Claudia shook hands mechanically, thanked him mechanically, and sat down. The octave is over. Lucisti satis. How does it go? Tempus abire tibi est. You will notice the preparations for departure everywhere here. Indeed, had all been well, we should have gone aboard the yacht on Sunday afternoon. But there has been a sudden change in my wife's mental condition. I'm afraid that when you came in just now, you heard I saw Mrs. Lamb. The nurse took her back into her room. Believe me, I am very sorry. Well, this change, though not uninteresting from one point of view, is of course exceedingly sad and it has altered my plans slightly my wife cannot possibly come with us now and i have not yet finished the arrangements for her remaining in england it may be monday before we can start where are we going sandell i own you now i do not want to insist on that ownership more than is necessary for my purpose and i cannot bring myself to give you an order like a servant but I ask you for your own sake not to put questions to me about the future. Do not ask what I'm going to do with you. Sandell looked the doctor straight into the eyes. I know very well what you're going to do with me, he said. You believe, said the doctor, that I intend to use you for the subject of experiment, and yet you keep your word. Well, I was sure you would. You were sure, Claudius said? Yet I have been followed by your detectives tonight right up to your house. My good Sandell, I have never employed a private detective in my life. I should think it dishonorable. And it has the additional disadvantage of being almost always useless. They are far from clever, that class, as a rule. At the same time, I can readily believe that you were followed here, and that you're being shadowed now. I can believe that there may be someone in London who has sufficient interest in you to be suspicious of your mysterious disappearance, 
at a time when i understand you have every reason for not disappearing is that not so claudius remembered that mr wycherley had said that he would work on his own account and in the dark he saw it all now i think you're right i did you an injustice i believe i know now who sent them i have no doubt he believed he was acting in my interest but it was done without my knowledge and authority i should not have thought that i had any right to interfere with you in that way shall i tell you who i think sent them no said the doctor i don't think his name would interest me he can do nothing of course his very smart people will hardly come aboard my yacht they're amusing to watch for a short time but i don't propose to allow them to take a voyage with me sandell the doctor added after a pause in which claudius had not replied to him you look very tired and broken down you are also very depressed i will not keep you here much longer for you need sleep but there's one thing i want to say you have done me one injustice tonight, perfectly trivial as it happened and i am afraid that you also do me another injustice you doubt my humanity there was a time when you regarded me as a good samaritan you now regard me as a murdering devil the reaction has set in and possibly it has been assisted by the chatter of that mad woman i heard her talking to you now i cannot let you suspect my humanity and partly for that reason and partly because i really trust you i will change my mind and tell you what i have arranged you are of course to be the subject of experiment claudius sandell looked steadily and contemptuously at the doctor i do not mean it in any offensive sense the doctor continued when i say that you are of no practical use to me for any other purpose i value your good opinion as i am now showing and have always found you a most pleasant and interesting companion if i were not yours absolutely and had any right to suggest i should suggest we pass over this part my dear fellow do not be so humble or so bad-tempered i'm not legree in uncle tom's cabin you can suggest anything you like and be sure that your suggestions will always be considered with respect and adopted whenever it is possible i do not bask and revel in villainy and for the purposes of melodrama i am useless your attitude towards me hurts me for days and nights i have been planning how to make everything as easy as possible for you shall we pass over that also certainly in one moment i want to tell you how things stand when the time comes i shall ask you to allow me to administer an anaesthetic after a time you will regain consciousness then from thirty to fifty minutes you will suffer the anaesthetic will be administered again immediately the doctor paused and when i regain consciousness the second time the doctor lit a cigar blew out the match and flung it into the grate you will not regain consciousness a second time that will be in fact that will be all that is why you're leaving england the doctor shrugged his shoulders there is no privacy in england he said but i ask you to notice that the very most you have to fear is fifty seconds of suffering probably not acute all the lurid pictures that your imagination may have conjured up or my wife and her madness may have depicted may be dismissed from your mind i am emphatically a humane man if it were not for my humanity for my broad love of the race for my infinite longing that some future generation might be born not under the curse which weighs us down but free and masters of their fate i would not even ask you for that little thing your life again claudius made no reply until that moment comes when i begin the experiment your comfort shall be my first consideration no indignity shall be put upon you except for that one purpose and what is connected with it you are free i have a considerable fortune said claudius i am afraid said the doctor that i cannot consent to accept gratuities 
you have already told me that money was of no consideration with you i was not intending to repeat my offer to buy myself from you i wanted to ask if i were free to dispose of my money now and to will it after my death as i wish absolutely perfectly free and i may write letters certainly any letters which do not prejudice my main purpose after we leave england you will omit the address of course thank you said claudius i have only one more question is there any consideration whatever which would induce you to terminate our agreement any consideration apart from money i had thought that you would be likely to ask the question and i have no objection to it my answer is none absolutely none at that moment francis entered the nurse would like to speak to you for a moment sir excuse me said the doctor and went out claudius leant forward with his head in his hands he felt how easy it would be to fall asleep and to forget in a moment or two the doctor returned the nurse he said seems to think that someone should sit up with my wife to-night it cannot be done the nurse has not been to bed for two nights and it would be hazardous to keep her up a third night unless it were absolutely necessary and i do not think it is fortunately i have to be up all night myself i have something in the laboratory which requires watching and i shall be here until six with the door open i shall hear any sound my wife sleeps downstairs now you know yes said claudius hardly conscious of what had been said yes it is her idea that her dead baby crawls about upstairs and would disturb her rest at any rate she will not sleep upstairs claudius rose from his chair may i go to bed now he said i am so tired that i am not very good company certainly i hope you'll find your room comfortable francis will get anything you want whiskey and soda before you go no ah claudius i'm sorry i can't give you my philosophy and i won't insult you by trying everybody has the philosophy which is suitable to the situation of somebody else my philosophy is the very thing for a man in your situation well well good night may i make one request again this legree business do please ask for anything you want said the doctor a little irritably i want you to begin this experiment as soon as possible to wait for it that is hard to do be assured smiled the doctor suavely that i also am impatient good night again sleep well and breakfast just when you happen to feel like it claudius left the room and went upstairs without a word the doctor went on composedly with his work and two hours slipped by he had grown drowsy and leaning forward with his head on his arms fell into a doze he often found that half an hour's sleep snatched in this way made a great difference to him and sent him back to his work as fresh and energetic as ever and as he slept pit-pat pit-pat across the stone floor of the hall came the sound of naked feet past the bare hall where the windows had stared like lidless eyes since the curtains were packed away and unfaded patches stood where pictures had been and the naked gaslight flared past the hall and down the passage came hilda lamb quiet and cunning as a cat with all hell awake in her mad eyes she opened the study door softly she smiled when she saw that the doctor was asleep without a sound she passed through into the laboratory and switched on the electric light she opened the big mahogany case of instruments and was careful not to let the click of steel be heard she took what she wanted switched off the light and came back into the studio again the bright edge of the thing she held in her hand attracted her attention brrr, brrr, brrr she said in her throat imitating the sound of the grindstone dr lamb began to move his head in a moment she flung herself upon him and thrust and hacked and pulled 
a storm came into the dream that claudius dreamed that night the forked lightning split the sky the thunder cracked and roared below were people with white frightened faces a dense mass of people all looking upward they began to howl with terror waving their arms the dream suddenly ceased and claudius was awake he was awake and the room was filled with smoke some one was knocking violently at the door and crying to him to get up fire fire and some one outside in the garden was singing a poor mad woman that had been rescued from the merciful fire the servants of the house watched her in awestruck silence as she was dragged away ceasing her singing from time to time and fighting hard to get back to the flames the fire had broken out in the annex in the doctor's study this was completely wrecked before the arrival of the engines the main body of the building was damaged but not ruined in the grey early dawn the police on watch talked confidently among themselves i saw her myself said one of them and there was blood both on her hands and face it'll be broadmoor at a little distance from the house claudius stood alone on the road and looked towards london a four-wheeled cab lumbered slowly up and francis who had gone to wimbledon to order it jumped down from the box it's the best they can do sir thanks said claudius as he got in it'll do very well tell him to drive as quickly as he can yes sir where to sir ursiston square francis shut the carriage door ursiston square he echoed as he seated himself beside the driver again end of chapter eighteen recording by john brandon end of the octave of claudius by barry payne